Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. I brought my Baba on my channel today because we are gonna be doing a Palestinian dish. I thought it would be good to come on here, celebrate our Palestinian culture. Today we're gonna be making kufta, which is a very, very delicious but simple dish. I wanted to choose something that was easy that most people could do. And we'll just kind of walk through like the history and our story and, and the story of Palestinians. For those of you who don't know what kufta is, I will be linking the recipe down below for any of you guys who would like to make it as well. It's very simple to make. Every culture pretty much has a version of kufta. In the south here, it's meatloaf. We have you know, our own different spices and things like that that we use and it's just absolutely delicious. Every country, every culture, they have their own meatloaf and the kufta is similar to meatloaf. That's true. Yeah, and the ingredients are onions and in parsley, they're chopped up and mixed together. Uh, tomatoes, potatoes, uh, mixed spices, olive oil. And I also wanted to just use my platform to speak up for Palestinians because everything that you see on Western media just shows one side of the story. And my dad is Palestinian. My grandmother was actually directly affected and was kicked out of her home in Palestine in 1948. My dad grew up learning all the stories from his family about everything that happened with the Palestinians and our family was directly affected by that. I said before we started all of this is that this is at some point or at some time it might be a bit emotional for me. Yeah. I don't know of any Palestinian family that was not affected by the 1948 Nakba. Mm -hmm. The Nakba, for those of you who don't know what Nakba is, it is, it is uh, called the Great Catastrophe, mm -hmm. where Palestinians uh, suffered uh, criminal acts against them, horrific criminal acts that forced them out of their homes. I don't think that, that there is any Palestinian family mm -hmm. that was not impacted directly by uh, the Nakba, the 1948 Catastrophe. What the Israeli government would do is they would commit acts of violence against Palestinians. These Palestinian families would hear about this happening in neighborhoods nearby and so they would get scared and so what happened is they fleed because they didn't want that to happen to their family and they thought, oh, we'll just be leaving for a few days, few weeks. They were actually never able to return to their homeland. Violent criminal acts were committed against innocent civilians whereby children were literally slaughtered, killed. Women were attacked and raped. And this was done by design so that people will lose their security and feel, uh, 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 they, they no longer feel safe and secure. And therefore, it caused people to flee. They decided, well, the, 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 these crimes are taking place around us and everywhere, and we need, we need to flee, we need to leave until maybe things will get better. So where did Tata, where did their family flee to? My mother is from Jerusalem, and they lived in Jerusalem. They left Jerusalem and went to Jordan. That's where they, they went to. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother and, and her parents, my grandparents, and every other family, there was 700 to about thousand to about a million Palestinian that left their their homes uh, and, and, and thought, you know, we'll be back in two days. This will be two days, three days, four days, mm -hmm. and we will return back to our homes. Uh, this is just temporary. And now, 75 years later, mm -hmm. my, my mother, may, may Allah be merciful on her and my father, they're both are dead. Mm -hmm. They passed. Here we are. We're seeing another a return of the Nakba, mm -hmm. a systemic, deliberate act of creating another Nakba, where, whereby they're, they're trying to, to kill people and, 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 and move them out of Gaza into the Sinai Desert or wherever they want to move them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's really happening right now. I think we should first start out saying what we thought and what we felt whenever we found out what happened on October 7th. It was a shock with the claims that of what Hamas did, um, but it wasn't a shock of why it happened, if that makes any sense. When we first heard of the uh, Hamas attack, 
uh, we had mixed feelings. Yeah. On one hand, uh, we understood why Hamas would make an attack. Right. Uh, because we know the history, we know the background uh, of the occupation, of the blockade. Which we'll uh, get into all of that yeah. stuff too. Uh, but on the other hand, it was very surprising to us to hear uh, Hamas being accused of burning 40 babies. And Beheading the babies. Killing babies. The, ra and, the mass rape. Killing innocent civilians. Which actually, the 40 beheaded babies came out that it was actually, they retracted that statement. Basically, this is a strategy and a policy and a history of the state of Israel. And we're not talking about the citizens of Israel, we're talking about right. those people who are governing. They create a lie and they repeat it. It becomes a big headline. And it becomes the headline, thank you. And they run with it. Exactly. And it makes Muslims and Palestinians out to be barbaric. It just justifies well, any, being Anyone able who to... commits a crime like that is barbaric. When you attack innocent civilians and you kill children and you kill uh, unarmed people. And, and that's something that we need to clarify is that we do not condone killing of any innocent lives, whether it be Palestinians or Israeli civilians. Um, but we, the thing is, we're not justifying what happened at all. We are explaining why this happened, uh, which we will get into. The claims that Israel made with regards to the 40 babies. So they made the claim, and then when they and were- they took it back. And they took it back. But it was too late. It was too late. It was too late because all the headlines already said beheaded babies, and now everyone is just running with that. But that also explains why we were surprised that uh, uh, Hamas being an Islamic yeah. group, and we know those who claim to be Muslims, right. we know uh, uh, whether they are true Muslims or not, based on their behavior, based on their actions, uh, Islamic teachings and, and, and Quranic instructions uh, tells us otherwise, tells us that this killing is absolutely unacceptable, right. that this, not, this is not an Islamic behavior, uh, yeah. And so it was shocking to us. Yeah, in our religion, and, it says killing one innocent person is like killing all of humanity. You know, we obviously, like, killing any innocent life is completely wrong. So, absolutely. Actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said that, you know, وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We have prescribed in, in, onto the, the children of Israel that whoever... Uh, kills one life, takes one life away, as if they have taken the life of all humanity, all humanity from when God created humanity until it ends. This is how important it is, the, the, the life is important, the life is to Muslims and those who practice Islam. So it's very difficult to say, to, 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 to to say, yes, th this is what Hamas did. And that's where the shock came. It turned out to be that uh, it was Israeli IDF soldiers and army is the one who actually uh, bombed uh, the facility in which there were some children in and, and burnt the children or killed the children. Uh, likewise, there were uh, the ones who were fleeing, uh, the Israelis who were fleeing uh, also said that uh, that, that it's their own army that was shooting at them and killing. I mean, they were shooting buildings with, with, with tanks, and that's, that's really where the, 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 the proof strike. came. Yeah. That, the, you know, the, the, the Hamas uh, fighters didn't have tanks with them. And this is what caused the killing of these innocent uh, children. So then what was the reason that Hamas came to take hostages of innocent people? Which we obviously, like I've said before, we don't condone that. We don't condone of taking innocent people as hostages. But what is the reason that they did this? The reason is the occupation, a yeah. brutal occupation. That's the reason right. that Hamas uh, 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 acted the way they did. So before we go any further, it's important that we go ahead and distinguish between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Because any time that a Palestinian, a pro-Palestinian, uh, speaks up, they're automatically hit with you're anti-Semitic and basically shuts down everything that you know we're trying to say. And the truth is that we are absolutely the farthest thing from anti-Semitic because we 
in our religion are taught to respect all religions. Um, and the truth is that there are Jewish people that don't agree with the practices of the Israeli government. Our problem is with the Israeli government, with the occupation, with the idea of Zionism, and it is not about religion. It is a humanitarian issue at the end of the day. We do not have any, any, any issues with, with, with Jewish people whatsoever. As a matter of fact, uh, I've had many Jewish friends over the years, and very good friends. Uh, this is not a Jewish, uh, Muslim, uh, or a Christian Jewish, or a Christian Muslim issue. This is a humanitarian issue. This is humanity. This is what it is. Killing of innocent civilians is, 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 is against humanity. If it was Jewish people that were dying, we would be up in arms as well. If we weren't that way, then we wouldn't be following our religion. We wouldn't be humans. That's we what wouldn't be humans. humans. That's what makes you a human being. Who is Hamas? Like, how did they start? Because everyone knows them as a terrorist organization, but you know, how did they come about? Something that I learned after doing more research recently is that they actually started out as an activist organization and they started out in Palestine due to the occupation. They started creating clinics, schools, charities for the people of Palestine because they were under this occupation. Naturally, it progressed as a result of the brutal occupation. See, the people in Gaza that live in Gaza, they all lived in Palestine. There was no Gaza and Hamas and the West Bank. There was Palestinians living in Gaza and the rest of the West Bank, enduring and suffering the brutal occupation, including the killing of innocent civilians and children on a regular basis. When a family would lose a child or a man or a woman or an old person, Hamas was always there as an activist organization to help the, the people who have suffered. And Hamas gained popularity. That popularity paved the way for Hamas to move from a, an activist slash humanitarian organization into a political movement. You see, you have to understand that the Palestinians have no weapons, no, uh, no political movement within that to help them. No government. No government. Nothing that would, would that, that would speak for them. This is before uh, 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 they brought in the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization. By then, Hamas had gained popularity and became the voice that the Palestinians expressed their resistance through becoming a political movement against the occupation, they then saw the need to arm themselves to defend themselves. And that's how Hamas was, was, was born and became. Israel signed a, an agreement of two-state solution. Uh, there was a push for uh, the Palestinians to have an election, a democratic election, so that they can have a government to represent them. They had the election and Hamas ran and they won majority. At that point, unfortunately, Israel labeled them a terrorist organization because they didn't want them to be the ones who would win on one hand. On the other hand, indirectly actually supported them. They pushed uh, 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 Hamas into Gaza, in which they took refuge in Gaza, there. And, and, and Israel ended up occupying Gaza. And through the resistance of Hamas and the, and, and, and the people of Gaza, then uh, they, they pushed the Israelis out. Mm -hmm. But then the Israelis put a blockade on, on the people of Gaza, and air, no airspace for them. They can't fly anything. They can't have any airspace. Uh, the, the sea blockade, they can only fish a, a, a certain distance from their own shore. And you were saying uh, that even there, there are no fish where they're allowed to fish. Correct. <laughs> the fish are beyond the point they're allowed Ex to fish. Exactly. And that's, that's, you have to understand, that's what occupation for these people are. It, you know, and we get our fish on a regular basis. So we don't think about it. And, and for residents, they're fishermen when they go out to fish and they sit in the sea fishing forever and they can't catch a fish because they know the fish is actually there. But Israel won't allow them to. 
to go fish there. That kind of, 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 of treatment breeds hate, breeds the kind of action that Hamas took on October the 7th. Mm -hmm. When you blockade people and you create a city in which has over 2 million people in it, 40, 50% of the people are unemployed. Right. They're impoverished. Let's go ahead and maybe explain what the size of Gaza and how many people are in it so people can understand. Gaza is 25 miles long by five miles wide. It's a tiny strip of land within uh, the boundaries of Israel. Um, and there are 2.2 million Palestinians living in there. Uh, half of them being children. And so like you said, they've created the blockade around them and Israel actually built the wall around Gaza. So they are completely shut off from the rest of the world, which is why people call it an open air prison. Thank you, exactly. They have no jobs, they have no future, they have no hope. Mm -hmm. Then what are they to do? Yeah. Add to that the fact that Israel flies over with their fighter jets and bombs them and claims that they are hitting a Hamas target. As Lena described, Gaza is densely populated. Any video I've ever seen of Gaza is there's hundreds of people in the one video because it's so densely populated. Israel, on a regular basis, flies over and bombs them and not only kill a Hamas operative, but at the same time, they're killing other individuals, children, women, old people, sick people. Mm -hmm. Is that going to breed love for Israel? I no, mean, I mean, it's not going to make anyone love Israel that lives in Gaza. Now, as a result of what people are seeing, what this Zionist baby killers, uh, genocidal, barbaric animals, the rest of the world, including Jewish people, have come and expressed their support for the Palestinians. There are Zionists who say, I am for the state of Israel, but I am against what they are doing. There are many people who live in Israel and who are against their own government. They're seeing the atrocities that their government is doing to the Palestinians and they don't agree with it. So we talked about Gaza, we talked about Hamas, we talked about why Hamas is resisting this occupation where they are. But there's a whole other story because Palestine is not just Gaza. There's also the West Bank. And within the past month, there have been over 200 people killed in the West Bank and there's no Hamas there. So let's explain kind of what, what's going on in the West Bank. The West Bank is, is where uh, the rest of the Palestinians live outside Gaza. Mm -hmm. And uh, that part is also uh, is occupied by the state of Israel. They endure uh, the result of occupation. Apartheid practices against the Palestinians, uh, confiscation of land. I myself, in our own family, have had, uh, I've been informed that we own land in Palestine. And I was informed that a good piece that we had of land uh, has been confiscated by the Israelis, and we, we cannot sell it, we can't do anything to it. Uh, they just come and decide, okay, this is a piece of land that we want, for whatever purpose they want it, and they'll take it. And this they is... will not compens compensate you for it, they will just take it and claim it. And this is illegal under international law. Absolutely. Also, they will go into houses, and they will, will, will take over the house, and in, in, in intimidate. These are regular practices. We can maybe talk about the Jewish settlers that come from other countries. They come in, they're backed by the IDF, the Israeli soldiers. They bring in soldiers with them and they go into these Palestinian homes and they kick them out. They just come in and say, okay, you need to get out because this is our home now. Um, and they're doing that within within the neighborhoods of, of Palestinians in the West Bank. Correct. This is regular practice. This is not just uh, 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 one uh, incident or two or what have you. This is happening on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they come in, uh, uh, tell you, you have to leave. You have to leave because this house belongs to me. These are settlers that have come from Europe.
and everywhere else in the world, and coming to a house and knock on the door and say, you need to leave. And then they, they, the Israeli army is there supporting them. The Jews throughout the world are told by the Israeli government that you can come over here and move to Palestine, to Israel. They call it Israel, we call it Palestine. Move over here and then we'll give you a free home, we'll give you a free uh, health benefit, mm -hmm. we'll give you jobs, will support you. Of course, all of that is supported by the American tax dollars. This is the reality for the Palestinians in the West Bank. Those are the ones who are not living in Gaza. Those are the ones who are living elsewhere, outside Gaza. These are not isolated incidents. This is common practice. This is what the occupation means. It also means checkpoints throughout the West Bank. It means if you want to go from point A to point B, or from, from one town to another, there are soldiers, uh, 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 military posts that will stop you, question you, uh, to identify yourself, where you're going, and what have you. And that's not enough. That's not just w where it will end. They will delay you. They will make you wait. For hours. On purpose. To dehumanize you. To, to, to belittle you. Humiliate you. Exactly. And this is common practice for the Palestinians. It also includes, we're talking about the occupation and what that means because people don't understand. It also includes coming in your house, IDF soldiers coming in your house at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning, knocking on the door and entering your home and telling you to go wake your kids up. Three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old. We've seen all of that. We know it's been happening and now it's out. The videos are out to show the proof of all of this. They question the kids. They see a scratch on the kids. They go, what is that from? Because the kid was throwing a rock at an, an IDF soldier resisting the occupation. Then they arrest the, the child. Mm -hmm. Arresting six and seven and eight and nine year old children. There Arrested. are over 10,000 uh, uh, prisoners that, that, that Israel has taken. And the Palestinians consider those people who are wrongly imprisoned as hostages. Because they are not allowed a lawyer, they're not allowed a trial. Due process. Then you, you, can, you might then understand why then did Hamas go and take hostages so that they can put the pressure on the government of Israel and say, release our people that you have wrongly arrested. I personally, I can tell you from a personal experience, I visited Palestine when I was 14 years old with my parents and my siblings. And my father is from a small, uh, small town close to Nablus, okay? And this is something we've never seen and we're not used to seeing. One o'clock and two o'clock in the morning, Israeli soldiers march through the streets of the, of, the, of the small town. And you see them with their machine guns as children. We're looking at them going, what are they doing? The next thing that we experienced was that their fighter jets flying low enough over uh, uh, the, these small towns. I experienced that, in which it makes the ground that you are on shake. So you're in a house, and your house starts to shake. It creates fear. And this is all is a, a, is, is a form of intimidation, so that you will understand if you dare to do anything we are here, we are very powerful, mm -hmm. and we will crush you. That is in addition to all the other things they do. Now we can talk about um, building permits with, within Palestine as well. We were looking up a statistic, and it said that Israel denies 98% of Palestinian building permits. Israel tells the, the Palestinians, in order to build a, 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 a house for yourself, then you have to apply for a permit. And when the Palestinians apply for a permit, they're denied. That goes back to the article or the study that you looked up and saw, that 98% of those uh, permit applications are denied. 98%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, here is, what, here, here is what makes it even more difficult. When you build, regardless, because you, you, you need a place to live, mm -hmm. and this is your land, your own land, you build on it, hoping they won't catch you. But when they catch you, they will come 
and demolish your home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop there. Then they will take that from you and say, this is not an area where you can build, we told you. For a few weeks or months later, for them to come back and build what's called a settlement, homes and houses and apartments and duplexes on there. And why? So that the settlers that are coming from Europe and the United States and all over the world, so they can have a home. So now we talked about the occupation, what that means with you know, dehumanizing Palestinians and the checkpoints and the violence and everything like that. But you also hear about Israel being an apartheid state. So I thought we could get into that and talk about why is it called an apartheid state? An apartheid state is a state that has a set of laws and privileges for its citizens and a different set of laws and a treatment for the undesirable ones, which is the Palestinians. When you take someone's land and you say you can't build on your land and you give them some bogus reason why you, 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 you can't build on it, and then they, they build on it and give it to people who came from other countries. When you deny them basic privileges, there are streets in Palestine in which Israelis can go on and Palestinians can't go on. They deny Israeli citizenship to the Palestinians. Absolutely. Uh, when, when, when Israelis are treated in the most humane way while Palestinians are belittled, there are uh, reports upon reports that have been written by Amnesty International, United Nations. This is not just me telling you that. This is, this is the world saying these people behave in a, an apartheid manner towards the Palestinians. So basically there is a different set of laws for the Israelis versus the Palestinians. For example, we talked about the Jewish only roads. The Palestinians have a different license plate than the Israelis do. I just recently learned this in the past couple of weeks is that Israel has admitted to actually giving Ethiopian Jews that came to Israel sterilization shots so that they would not reproduce, which is just a disgusting, disgusting practice. This is just a glimpse of what this, uh, this regime, their, their racist behavior and actions towards even its own citizens, right. just because they happen to be a different color. So we talked about Gaza, we talked about the blockade, we talked about the West Bank, we talked about the occupation there. We did all of this to kind of spell it out to you that this is not about Hamas. This is truly just Israel wanting to get rid of the Palestinians and make their life as miserable as possible in, in Israel. In Basically, Palestine. they are creating a second Nakba right now by carpet bombing and indiscriminate bombing, criminal acts and barbaric acts of killing and, they have and, and, bombed and violence. Schools. They have bombed hospitals, refugee camps. They cut off the water, they cut off the electricity, cut off humanitarian aid and food. Their latest is now they're targeting bakeries bakeries right. that provide basic food for the population. Where is Hamas there? The argument there with the Western media is always that Hamas is using them as human shields. And to that, I would say, I don't feel like that is a justification for anything. Think about if a shooter was, you know, an active shooter was in a school. This, that would be like their method would be to just bomb the whole school to get rid of the shooter. I, I don't think that that is a justified claim that, oh, they're using them as human shields. Some people don't think sometimes when, when somebody is making a claim, they don't think about uh, 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 the, 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 what that really means in, in, that means in, in, you're, in, in you're... all of what that entails. When, 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 when Israel flies over and, and bombs innocent civilians, and they say, well, we've told them that we're gonna bomb them, and we've given them That's another thing. time they that to, to leave, they warn them where they have no they place come. to leave. They have no place to leave, they have no place to go. And even those who have gone where Israel told them to, they've bombed them, they've killed them. Mm -hmm. so where are they supposed to go? And then we're supposed to, uh, 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 or the rest of the world is supposed to accept the fact that Israel is informing people to leave where they live, uh, otherwise they're going to be bombed. Right. 
And that somehow, some way is acceptable. They say, oh, uh, we know that there was a Hamas operative in this particular location and therefore we bomb. Okay, but you also knew that there were all of these innocent people mm -hmm. and you also bombed. My thing is, if Israel is the mo one of the most advanced militaries and sophisticated technology and all the things that they have with the backing of the U.S., how is this the only solution that they have to get rid of Hamas, is to bomb innocent civilians, hospitals, schools, etc.? That's where our problem lies with that. The reality is Israel has shown its true intention and its true colors by killing over 10,000 people right now in Gaza. Those are the ones who right. have been at least accounted for. And Those over are the ones 4,000 children. And, and no, no, we don't know how many under the, the rebel. Right. Many, many people we have seen throughout all the videos and what we've heard that they, they've lost an entire family you know, and, and Palestinians are known for having large families. The smallest Palestinian family is maybe four, and that's considered even a very, very, very small family. I come from a family of nine mm -hmm. siblings. I saw a video of this girl one time talking about how she grew up in Israel, and that was one of like the racist things that they would say about Palestinians is, Oh, they have so many kids, like they just, there are just so many of them. One of the things why Palestinians, and, and I know I grew up in this household, is that my father and my mother used to say, we need to have as many kids as we can because they, their objective is to get rid of us. And every Palestinian has taken on that responsibility. You know, we've taken on that responsibility, my wife and I, we've had four children here in the United States. We're considered a large family mm -hmm. compared to the others that have two, perhaps maybe three. You know, uh, I know, like I said, in, in my own family, we had nine. My uncle, on one hand, he had seven. You know, and, and many, many people, se seven is actually kind Average. of a low number. <laughs> now you have nine, 11, 13, you know. That's, that's normal. We talked about how this is clearly not about Hamas. So what is this about? It's very obvious to us that this is a, an objective to create another Nakba so that there be a, a huge exit of the population of Gaza from Gaza to the Sinai Desert. Mm -hmm. Which is clear to, the, to why they are having people evacuate south, which is pushing them towards that area. There are many reasons mm -hmm. why, why Israel wants that land. Israel, since its inception, has had a, uh, a, 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 a major plan. And their plan is from the Nile to the Euphrates. They want all of that, they want control of all of that land. And that's what their plan is. And little by little, if you look at a map of Palestine and where the Palestinians live and lived for the last 75 years and how much land Israel has taken over, you will see that it, this is their own uh, you know, uh, resources and sources talking about what they've done. Gaza is part of that plan, is to take over and make it part of Israel. So they want all these Palestinians out of their way so that they can have Gaza. Then the question becomes, why now? Mm -hmm. in, in light of what's happening in Europe, uh, whereby they are in need of the natural gas and they don't want Russia to provide that natural gas, it just so happens that natural gas and abundance of it has been discovered off of the coast of Gaza. And if Israel, then it, we're talking about billions of cubic uh, square meters of, of, of natural gas. The, we're talking about billions upon billions of dollars for many, many years to come. So get rid of the Gazans, take over the land, and take over the natural gas, and that's, that's another income for them. Mm -hmm. It's a, basically, again, it's about money and land. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Take over the land and take over the, the, the resources. We talked about that this, this is not a Jewish, uh, Islamic, or religi religious uh, right. issue here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, here is the reality. The reality is the state of Palestine is a state that Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in that land. And they yeah. were all Palestinians. Yeah, that's something we should have maybe mentioned in the beginning. At some point in the past, there were the people who believed in Ibrahim and Ismail and that religion who lived there. And then there was uh, 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 the, the, the Jewish religion in mm -hmm. which a lot of those people embraced the Judaism. Right. You know. But those people stayed there. When Jesus came along, some of those people converted to Christianity. And when Muhammad وسلم, came along, the prophet of Muslims, mm -hmm. some of those people who were Jews and Christians converted to Islam. All of them are still Palestinians, and that land belongs to all of them. I can tell you about myself. My great-great-grandfather was a Jew. Tata. Your mom used to talk about how when she was little, Jews, Muslims, Christians, all lived in, in peace in Palestine. And those were the indigenous people to that land. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We, growing up, didn't know any difference in our household between Christians, Jews, or Muslims. We didn't know. My mother grew up in Jerusalem, as I've said that before, in which the three religions are practiced freely and respected equally. And so, uh, there was an appreciation for the, the, the religious rituals between all the three religions mm -hmm. within. So my mother, for example, had cousins that were Christians, mm -hmm. okay? And so she, was, she would play with them, hang out with them. When it was Easter, she would celebrate with them. When it was Ramadan, they would celebrate with her. That's beautiful. I oh, yes, even, that's, I that's how that. it, oh, yes. As a matter of fact, growing up in our household, when it was Easter time, my mother would boil eggs, color the eggs, and so on and really? so forth. Oh yes, in our household, the Islamic household. Yeah. All right, because that was the tradition in Jerusalem. So that gives you a glimpse of how these three religions interacted together until and respected Israel came each along. other. You know, <laughs> until Israel came along and took over the land and wanted to create this this divide between them yes. and claim that Muslims against Jews and what have you. And that's not, that shouldn't be the case at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. What is the answer to all of this? How do we get peace? How, how do we move on from this? It is in the best interest of Israel and the Israeli citizens of Israel to end the occupation. 75 years later, where we are at this point now, and seeing how the world is seeing Israel and its brutal occupation. These are not words anymore that someone is telling a story. The rest of the world are seeing the actions and exactly what Israel is doing. And something I would add is, even if you eliminate Hamas, if you still have the occupation, you're gonna breed this hatred and another Hamas group is going to arise and you're not gonna end the, the root of the problem here. You're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, over the last however many 20 years, Israel has killed many, 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 many Hamas leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and they're just, be, new just getting more and more and more. And stronger Hamas leaders emerge. And something we didn't point out is that a lot of people who are part of Hamas, these are people who their families have been all killed by Israelis. They've lost everyone. They lost their wife, their kids. These are the type of people that have such anger and you know hatred in their heart. So this Absolutely. is why they are behaving this way. Violence begets violence. We believe that if we just end this occupation, we treat Palestinians like you would any other Israeli citizen. Give them their dignity. Give them their dignity. Their human rights. Give them the right to live and exist just like any other human being. The defense minister of Israel called the Palestinians, not just Hamas, the Palestinians human animals that need to be eliminated. This is the kind of government that represents the state of Israel. And we know not all the Israelis think that way. Yes, that's and something, I, that want to, yes, that's something I want to stress. Pro-Palestinian people have to, we have to accept that there are Israelis who don't agree with their government. There are innocent civilians in Israel who, they, there were lives taken from them as well. And I think if we all just see each other as human beings, that is where we find peace. Another thing that I think 
is, is important or I think is worth mentioning for all of us during this difficult time in which we, we are hurting mm -hmm. and we are uh, feeling uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of anxiety. We tend to take it out on each other. Some people take it out on each other. Yes, uh, 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 you have the right to be angry mm -hmm. and you have the right to be frustrated. But it doesn't help when we attack each other and we start pointing out uh, this person is that way and that person is that way. This is not the time to do that. This is not, absolutely not the time. It doesn't help the cause of the Palestinians. No, it doesn't help in any way, form or shape. Uh, first of all, we don't know what everyone is doing. No one knows what you're doing. No one knows what Omar is doing. No one knows what Emily is doing. No one knows what I'm doing. Some of us are, are spending their effort and time pointing out what somebody is doing and what they're not doing and what they're, whether they're doing enough or they're not doing enough. Just do what you can to help. Do that of what you can, no matter how little it is. Mm -hmm. This is not the time for us to get on each other and hate each other and it's hate on each causing other. Causing divide within our own Muslim community. Honestly. Right now we have people mm -hmm. who are dying. Yes, we yeah. know so-and-so is not participating and so-and-so is not posting and so snow is not doing but the rest of the world is and we need to to be on that side yeah. with everybody else there will come a time in which we can deal with that later but that doesn't help our cause right now it doesn't help it at all it just creates division within within all of us this is an opportunity to seize this is the world has come together mm -hmm. this is not an opportunity to divide yeah. this is an opportunity to unite Okay, so that, that, that's important, I think, for all of us to, to, to understand. And also, at the same time, understand we have commitment and we have responsibilities and we force ourselves to go on in our life. Okay, we pulled our kufta out of the oven and we made a sauce for it. So the juice that was created with the meat, so the broth, we took the broth and we mixed it with tomato paste and we created the sauce that we're going to pour on top. So I guess I can do that. I'll do the honors. I guess the, the last thing that I wanted to discuss now is I know that we're all hurting. Our entire Muslim Ummah, we're all, we've all been grieving the past almost month now. And a lot of us are trying to figure out how to cope with this grief that we're feeling. So do you have any words? Yes, for me personally, um, honestly, from the, from the beginning when I began to see the, uh, the uh, the innocent children killed and the innocent civilians murdered. It was very, very difficult to, to watch and endure and see. I'm sure just like many of you who watch this uh, barbaric killing, you can't help but break down. And you break down because you feel helpless. And uh, mm -hmm. I had to think what and how and what's going on and how, how I can make since some of this. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah, I began to think of Quranic verses that come to you, came to me. Uh, and there, there have been several. However, I couldn't think of a Quranic verse that would give me the satisfaction of making things reality. I know there were some out there, but this morning, Subhanallah, before I came over here, I was watching a video, unbelievable, a man who was looking for his family amongst the rebel. He had a hammer in his hand and somebody came up mm -hmm. to him and he said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for my family, four children. I saw I that have. video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help it. I, it. I mean, I broke down and began to cry. Because you think of you, you have four children and that could be yes. very well have been you. Absolutely. And you think, you know, uh, those four little children that died, I have grandchildren, I've had children. And I look, and subhanAllah, I don't know if it's me, but I look at the children of Gaza and I see their pictures. Those kids are some of the most beautiful children I have ever seen. They literally are. I mean, their, their features, everything about them, they're just beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous children. SubhanAllah. And now they're angels. Yeah. And so today, after I broke down, I was sitting by myself at the house. SubhanAllah, the ayah came to me. And so I actually 
went and looked it up. And here is what the ayah said. I'll read it in, 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 in Arabic first. And then I will uh, summarize the meaning of this ayah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahman ar-rahim. Wa la tahsaban. Sorry. It's hard to think about these, these things. Wa la bil ahya'un 'inda rabbihim yurzaqun. Farihina bima atahum Allah min fadlih. Wa yastabshiruna bil ladhina lam yalhaqu bihim min khalfihim alla khawfun 'alayhim wa lahum yahsanun. Yastabshiruna bi ni'matin min Allah wa fadl wa anna Allah la yudhi'u ajra al-mu'minin. الذين استجابوا لله والرسول من بعد ما أصابهم القرح للذين أحسنوا منهم واتقوا أجر عظيم الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل فانقلبوا بنعمة من الله وفضل لم يمسسهم سوء واتبعوا رضوان الله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, Do not think for a moment that those who have been murdered in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have been fighting for their God-given freedom, God-given rights, their land, do not think for a moment that those who have been murdered are dead. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are alive with their Lord and receiving his blessings. And then he goes to say, describing a little more, he says, فَرِحِينَ بِبَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing to us their status at this point, their condition, in which he says, they are pleased. That of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for them at that moment. And not only they are pleased and they are happy, but they are also looking forward for the rest of you to follow them. Saying and thinking, do not be sad. Do not be sad. Do not be afraid. And they are saying that they are looking, they, they are enjoying the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are looking forward to the day that the rest of you will join them. The ayah also jumps to another one. I'm going to skip one. It says, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ وَإِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, I feel like this, this pertains to the people of Gaza, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those are the people that they were told the, the, the rest of the world has ganged and gathered against you. So fear them. But instead of fearing the rest of the world, they said, no. We believe in Allah and our faith is stronger. And Allah is plenty for us. We don't need anybody else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَانْقَلَبُوا بِنِعْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ That level of iman, that level of faith that these people have reached, another level of blessings is bestowed on them. And subhanAllah, these words were, were revealed in the Quran 1400 years ago and how true they are to this day. Absolutely. And it just shows you how the Quran is, is a book for all times. And for all people. And for all people. Another ayah that I think about often, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ مُحْتَعِينَ مُقْنِعِي رُؤُسِهِمْ لَا يَرْتَدُّ إِلَيْهِمْ طَرْفُهُمْ وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَاء Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is letting the world know that if you are facing injustice. Do not think for a second that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not aware of that injustice 
that has been committed against you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is only giving these people time. And if they don't stop, if they don't repent, and I don't mean to turn this into a religious <laughs> sermon. No, it's helpful. It's helpful. Then they will face Allah on a day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمًا تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ Which means they will be shocked by what they will see. They will be shocked that their eyes will open wide and they will look and they can't even blink from the shock. One thing about us Muslims is that we know this. There are two kinds of sins. There is the sin that you commit when you don't do your salah and when you don't fast and when you don't do the but basically what we call the uh, uh, worship rituals those are the thing, the sins that you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and he will forgive you because he's most forgiving but then if we muslims commit an act of violence and injustice against any human that will not be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have to seek the forgiveness of that person. But if you insist on your criminal behavior, then you will face the punishment of Allah on the Day of Judgment. And that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what gives us strength. Yeah. There are so many ayat in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about. There's another one I'd like to share with you. There was a time in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for volunteers in an army that he was preparing to defend the to defend Medina but they had to leave and I think it was the Romans not sure but it, this was mentioned in the Quran so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi this was a time in which the people didn't have much but he needed to prepare the army so he asked for two things he asked for volunteers and he asked for donations. So he received all the donations that were, there were going to be. So he was limited because the people didn't have much. So there were some people, volunteers, that went to Rasulullah and said, we are ready to volunteer to be soldiers in this army. And here is what Rasulullah replied. I don't have any, ar any arms to give you. I don't have any swords. I don't have any... Uh, war gear to give you so you can volunteer and become part of this this army and those people uh, were turned down and when they left when they left Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they, will, they were filled with sadness and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala acknowledged those people and described them in this ayah and said they left and they were so overcome with sadness that they began to cry because they didn't have any way of participating. And that's like us, how we're feeling right now. Absolutely. And see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave anything for us. So those of us who are saddened and feel angry and mm -hmm. would, lo would love to do something and want to do something, then if there's something you can do to help, do it. But if there isn't anything you can do, just the fact that you want to do is plenty for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the way you feel angry and sad and crying is a normal feeling of a human being. Thank you guys so much for listening, for you know, listening with an open heart and just seeing the other side of you know, the plight of the Palestinians and what they've been facing, not just since October 7th, but for the past 75 years. And thank you, Baba, for coming oh, and welcome, adding your insight and all of your knowledge. Well, and I hope that we were able to maybe shed a light and we only did very little. Yeah, there's know, so for, much more we could say, but you know, yeah. how, how we would be here for days talking oh, absolutely. about. Absolutely. Thank you, Baba. You're and welcome. we are praying for Palestine. We're praying for all of you guys. And may Allah bring justice to the situation. Amen. Amen.